Welcome to the Fat Fueled Family Podcast, where every week we talk about things like nutrition, training, how to live a healthy and active lifestyle with your little ones, peaceful parenting, education, and of course, mindset. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Keto Counterculture, at Fat Fueled Mom, and at Fat Fueled Kids, and search for Fat Fueled Family on YouTube. To stay up to date with everything we're doing, sign up with your email at www.fatfuel.family and check out our blog for workouts, meal ideas, and all the other cool stuff we love to talk about. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Welcome to the Fat Fuel Family Podcast. I am Danny Vega and I'm joined by my overworked wife, <laughs> <laughs> Maura. How are you, my love? I'm good. All right, well, we don't have a lot of time because uh, our guest has given us an hour and he's a parent and we understand that. So um, we this week's guest is Dr. James DiNicolantonio. He's a cardiovascular research scientist and doctor of pharmacy at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City, Missouri, the author of Salt Fix and Super Fuel, and now of The Longevity Solution with Dr. Jason Fung. He's contributed extensively to health policy and has even testified in front of the Canadian Senate regarding the harms of added sugars. He's also, he also serves as the associate editor of Nutrition and Brit British Medical Journal's Open Heart, a journal published in partnership with the British Cardiovascular Society. He's the author or co-author of just about 200 publications in the medical literature, uh, nothing crazy. He's also on the editorial advisory boards of several medical journals and has shared his expertise on the Dr. Oz Show, the doctors, and international news media outlets. Welcome, Dr. James D. Antonio. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, we are excited to talk to you, so we're going to get right into it. Um, we always start with the question, what is the most critical problem you're currently trying to solve? Yeah, I mean, so really that question um, was sort of what I wanted to answer when I began writing the longevity solution. Um, really, before it really became more so about an entire dietary lifestyle book on how to promote longevity, it was almost like a plant versus animal protein book. Like, I really wanted to understand what is the difference? Like, is there really an overall better diet? And is there like a particular you know, type of diet that promotes longevity. And really, that's ultimately the question that I try, I've been trying to rack my, my brain around. And that's really kind of what this book, what Jason Fung is about, is kind of like, you know, you got the vegan side on one end of the spectrum, and you got the carnivores on the other. <laughs> it's and crazy it, how that happens, right? How yeah, they're both saying. Very polarizing. And it's kind of like, well, where, where does the data really lie? And I think both camps are kind of right in their own aspects. Um, and not to really give away the entire book, but, it, you know, there's benefits to both. And we can certainly dive into that. I'm excited to hear about that because I'm sure with your expertise in research and just combing through the literature, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, why it would be better to include, a, you know, a little bit of one and the other. Um, I first wanted to get your thoughts on something since I have you on. Um, I've asked other friends and experts in the low carb community about this. And it's that ratio of saturated and monounsaturated fats in our diet. So I've been primarily carnivore since 2017. And based on what I've read, I'm, I'm comfortable with the high amount of saturated fat in my diet. But sometimes I see comparisons between the two and I, there being a clear advantage of having more monounsaturated fat, like less inflammation, um, LPS, you know, endotoxin. And I've even asked our friend, Dr. Diagostino, and he told me in passing that he personally leans more towards monounsaturated fat in his diet. So what I'll do is sometimes I'll buy a leaner ground beef, for instance, and I'll mix in some delicious olive oil and maybe change the profile a bit. Um, what are your thoughts? And, you know, am I overthinking this? No, you're not. You're definitely not overthinking it. Um, it is an important question. I think um, even more important is, you know, the types of foods that you're getting those fats from. But I mean, just in regards to the difference, um, I guess, you know, biochemically and also the response that your body has to saturated versus monounsaturated fat. For one, the the beta oxidation or, you know, the fat burning of saturated versus monounsaturated, the, Basically, monounsaturated fats get get burned for fuel better than saturated fats. Um, the also also monounsaturated fats um, they liberate more energy uh, when you consume them, and so you can feel a little more energized. It's interesting how fats can actually determine 
and your overall diet can determine how much you exercise depending on how much energy they liberate. So particularly long chain saturated fats from like things like dairy, cheese, they're more, they more tend to be stored because their oxidation rates are lower than monounsaturated fats. And also the thermic effect, meaning the amount of calories it takes to burn the particular fat is twice that for monounsaturated versus long chain saturated fat. That so, is a brand new, I did not know that. Wow. I mean, I know the difference, obviously like a MCT is, mm-hmm. is a, a saturated, right? Yeah. Well, um, but it still burns yeah, quicker. Medium, exactly. Um, your medium chain triglycerides, particularly C8 and C10, um, really don't get stored. C12 is, which is really from coconut oil. Um, it kind of acts like an MCT, but also a little bit more like a long chain saturated fat where some of it does get stored, but it has other health benefits. But you're right. Basically, MCTs get directed directly to the liver to form ketone bodies, whereas long chain saturated fats, they will hit the lymphatic system and have more of a tendency to be stored. But again, if you're, if you're lean and you are metabolically flexible, it's not like the long chain saturated fats are going to cause you to gain weight. You just might not lose as much weight if you're consuming a diet, let's say high in animal fats versus in, in long chain saturated fats versus let's say more things like avocados. And then of course the merino omega threes increase your own fat burning, your own beta oxidation in the liver. So those are important as well. Wow. I, <laughs> you already hit us with something. I had no idea. Obviously, we, we've spoken about the differences between, you know, protein, carbs, and fat, you know, in, in their respective thermic effect. Um, but we've never, ever even thought about the differences between fats and... And their thermic effect, too. Yeah. Like, if I'm, if I'm someone who I'm, of course, always obsessed with burning the most fat, you know, it, it makes more sense now that um, I'm going to be having a lot more monounsaturated. And we are huge fans of olive oil. So, that's, that's easy to do. Um, yeah. So, the other reason I asked that is because there seems... This seems to be coming up a lot more in the literature, like the endotoxin or LPS which is obviously concerning, you know, uh, and I've read it that it can increase with everything from leaky gut to eating saturated fat, emulsified fats, uh, and of course, overeating to name a few things. But um, can you tell our, our audience a little bit about it and how it impacts our health and, and how we can try to lower LPS levels or keep them from rising? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a huge problem. So basically, health really does start with what you're eating. Um, of course, there's other factors. But when it comes to, let's say, diet, you know, uh, what you eat impacts your, you know, bacteria in the gut. And your bacteria can produce endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide, also known as LPS. And so different fats that you consume, say, omega six, for example, promotes the growth of certain bacteria that produce LPS. Um, whereas omega threes produce bacteria that don't produce LPS. And of course, omega six is more inflammatory, especially if it's coming from an isolated source, because it's oxidized, not only when you produce it, but also in your own stomach acid. And so that can damage the, the lining of your intestine, and cause this LPS to leak out systemically and even hit the brain and cause the release of TNF alpha, which can lead to leptin resistance. I don't want to get too far into the biochemistry, but basically, you know, endotoxemia seems to be at the heart of a lot of these metabolic issues. Basically, it's just a marker of, you know, a poor diet, you know, damaging your intestine and promoting the growth of bad bacteria, causing LPS and endotoxemia. But it ultimately comes down to what you're eating and you're, you know, um, Again, the omega-3, omega-6 has a huge impact. Refined carbs and sugars are going to promote LPS as well as damage to the intestine. Not consuming a good amount of resistant starch to promote the growth of good bacteria and to promote more mucin and a greater lining for the gut. Um, And then, you know, there's certainly a controversy on if lectins are really damaging or not. Um, That's pretty controversial. Uh, I, I hear that I've heard a lot of people switch recently. It's been very subtle, but I've seen that, you know, it's like, well, you know, like if you don't have gut issues, it's okay to have lectins where before it wasn't like it wasn't that way. So it's kind of cool to see, obviously, because I think people like to have options. Exactly. <laughs> um, yep. And and with these resistant starches, because the way I understand it is our gut bacteria um, can't break down LPS or at least it's very 
compromise or it's 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 effectiveness is compromised so i guess what you're saying is that these resistant starches would just make the army bigger to be able to deal with it a little bit better basically yeah um so you know depending on like geographically evolutionarily where you were located i mean you know plants could make up a very small portion of your diet or they could make up a very large portion but even if they were a small portion let's say let's say the inuit for example they still harvested seaweed they still harvested berries and stocked them for winter um, you know, they would consume the an- the plant contents. They actually considered it um, a delicacy, consuming the plant contents of their kills. Um, they would get fiber in their diet. It may not be a tremendous amount, but they and they weren't getting the harmful stuff that we all consume in the Western diet, damaging their intestines. So they wouldn't have to deal with it. But basically, what resistant starch does is it promotes the growth of um, basically bacteria to produce short chain fatty acids. So in a way you are fueling yourself with fats by consuming fiber. It's kind of a weird concept, right? Like a lot of people are so, they love fat and they're so anti-fiber. But if you can think of it as fiber is making you a, actually your colon, like a fat burning machine, you're producing these short chain fatty acids that have a dramatic benefit throughout the body. Um, And also it stimulates GLP-1, the, these resistant starches too, and, and GLP one can hit the brain and the, the blood vessels, and, and basically we have medications that try to increase GLP one, um, glucagon like peptide one, um, for benefits for lowering blood pressure, glucose control. So um, you know a low carb diet is great, but you you don't necessarily want to try to give up the resistant starch. And and there's there's this huge debate between right, like if you don't tolerate plants, fine, you know that's that's cool. You know what I mean? And, I, and I'm not trying to say that you have to be plant-based at all. I I do believe that's kind of what this book is about. The Longevity Solution is kind of balancing both. And, and we can go into the benefits of plant, why you want to consume both, um, because I think it's a, an important issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah let, let's go into that then a little bit. Since yeah, we're on the for topic. sure. So one thing people need to understand is the is the, the – the, the animal foods that we consume today and the plant foods that we consume today are not the same. They're actually both more damaging. Um, for <laughs> one, for one, you know, the, the fats in animal foods, they're basically what accumulates persistent organic pollutants. You get those through animal fats. The only way to bind those is plant fiber. So, yeah, I mean, it would be great if we didn't have environmental pollution, but we do. So we have to think about those things. If you're consuming a high animal fat diet, you are absolutely accumulating things like dioxin and PCBs, and the body has virtually no way of getting rid of it. I mean, literally, some of these persistent organic pollutants have half-lives of 10 to 15 years, unless you're able to consume a fiber that can bind them. So there's basically this, like, hepato... um, recycling through um bile and and the liver and it just keeps getting recycled and the only if you can hit hit it at a certain point where it's being basically excreted through bile with some fiber to bind it that can be beneficial which is why if i do consume animal fats i try to consume it with some type of plant fiber to bind those persistent organic pollutants now on the flip side there's benefit to consuming animal foods because they're more nutritious. And I say that because their nutrients are more bioavailable um, versus plant foods. Now, granted, a lot of if you're just consuming like muscle meat, muscle meat lacks certain vitamins and minerals that plants can bring you. But then, of course, you can use organs to kind of offset the low amounts of vitamins and minerals that are contained in just muscle meat. So you can do a carnivore diet great um, by consuming more organ foods. Um, People, people definitely they they're not they're not doing that, and and it's something that we've tried to bring the attention to. You know, eating hard and and liver and f- interesting ways to include it in the diet. Yes, exactly. And you know, the one thing that really got me because I was like, how can how can meat be bad for us? We've consumed this for two you know, 0.6 million years, honestly, how can meat be bad for us? And I don't think it's necessarily bad per se, but when I started like looking at the literature, obviously consuming, let's say, um, like venison is different than consuming a corn fed beef from like, you know, a a calf o cow, um, which most people, you know, they're like, yeah, I'm carnivore and they're eating like 12, like Wendy's patties. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, you are technically carnivore, but you're also 
consuming like CAFO meat that's been like probably deep fried in like omega-6 vegetable oil. So that's not what you want to do either. Um, But I started reading studies on actually how we process meat, like the, like the meat that you're consuming in the supermarket. I don't want to demonize meat. I love meat. I consume probably a pound and a half of meat a day. I, um, so I want that to be very clear. <laughs> um, but what ends up happening is when, when blood flow stops to the muscle, the porphyrin ring around iron starts to break down. Now that should not happen. You don't want to consume free iron ions. It's the most reactive substance that you can consume. It's the most damaging substance in the body is free iron ions. Unfortunately, we like our meat tender. So we like to hang our meat for several weeks before it even goes to the supermarket to tenderize it. So you are literally consuming something that has a lot of free iron ions and then you cook the heck out of the meat, right? So it's important to coat it with olive oil or coat it with vinegar because that's going to reduce the advanced glycation end products that are formed and the heterocyclic amines. So it's important that that extra, everybody's afraid of using organic extra virgin olive oil when it's literally the best fat to cook with. I mean, head to head studies show that it has less, you know, oxidative substances that are formed than even coconut oil. So people get a little scared because it's a monounsaturated fat, but it's so high in polyphenols, it completely prevents the monounsaturated fats from oxidizing. And it actually gets into your own food and makes it healthier because of it's enhancing the food that you're cooking the olive oil in with more polyphenols, which have been shown to prevent, you know, LDL oxidation and things like that. Um, But back to the point of why you need to combine meat with certain things is because we're, you know, as a carnivore, you would, you know, when a lion eats a kill, they eat it right away. They don't like saying, you know, I want to hang this for a couple of weeks and let it tenderize. (laughs) You know what I mean? What a great point. So I do think that people need to understand what's happening to the meat as it's hung, what's actually going on. And that those free iron ions have been shown to literally cause um, oxidation of the proteins in meat, the phospholipids and the fats. So you can do so. So the book kind of shows you smart ways to what you should eat with meat, get that great nutrition, that great protein, that great satiety, um, but not get the harms of the persistent organic pollutants, the free iron ions. So you can bind free iron ions with several things. You can use things like um, coffee, green tea, red wine. You can use things, probably the best way to bind it is what everyone demonizes as the, you know, the worst thing ever, the anti-nutrient phytic acid. (laughs) When phytic acid, if you look at any animal study, when they give phytate to the animals, it reduces the growth and the initiation of cancer by about 40 to 50%. And it's one of the best binders of free iron in the body. And it also has very good anti-calcification effects. So if you can eat an overall nutritious diet and incorporate phytic acid in a smart way to bind the iron, the free iron ions from meat, you are doing yourself a service um, and you are elevating your carnivore diet. It's not really a carnivore diet anymore, <laughs> but you are enhancing your diet in my opinion. Well, now it, do you need, do you need the phytic acid and the resistant starch or, or are they both, uh, are they both just helping each other or are they both have um, different yeah, they're roles? Both, yeah. They're both helping each other. Exactly. Okay. So they have different roles. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Now, um, before we get to the next question, well, actually, go ahead and ask the next question because I have a question on on, on that sub- on the question. <laughs> yeah, a question on the question. Yeah. All right. Well, let's s- talk a little bit about um, glycine and collagen. We take collagen regularly, and we have some bones in our crock pot right now. Um, and we also like to make a little blood sugar tonic uh, that usually has something like Perrier a- a- apple cider vinegar and like six grams of glycine. Can you educate our listeners on why glycine and collagen are so important for longevity? Yeah, that's a great question. So we used to consume the animal nose to tail, and there's a tremendous amount of collagen, um, you know, in skin. 70% of the protein in skin is made of um, collagen. And really the primary protein in collagen is glycine. One out of every three amino acids is made up of glycine. And so our diets are lacking collagen and glycine a lot. And just from an evolutionary perspective, since any time we would consume meat, we would get collagen with it. To get to the meat, we'd have to go through the hide and we would have to consume organs and we would consume the skin if we could. And um, you're getting a ton more collagen eating the entire animal. And from an evolutionary perspective, 
our biochemistry to synthesize glycine, while glycine is considered non-essential because we can make it, it doesn't seem like the human body can make an optimal amount for optimal collagen turnover. Now, it, I mean, it's very controversial how much we need. The leading scientists right now believe that we need at least 10 grams of glycine per day to optimally basically turn over collagen. Um, and the average person is consuming about three grams of glycine. So we may be at a seven to 15, but maybe even higher amount of glycine deficit. Now, collagen and glycine are insanely important because there are glycine receptors all over the body. And this hasn't been known for a very long time, but these glycine receptors are basically chloride channels and they're all over the body, including your immune system. And when you consume higher levels of glycine, it activates these receptors and brings chloride into the cell. And what this can do is it has many benefits. It suppresses inflammation in the, in the over immune response to things. So it may help with autoimmune diseases. Um, one of the things that LPS does is it hits the liver, the portal circulation, and your first defense is called these Kupfer cells in the liver, liver sinusoids. They are basically white blood cells that are overactivated, and they secrete a ton of inflammatory cytokines right at the liver. And this can lead to liver cirrhosis by literally eating a poor diet, overacting your immune system in the yeah. liver causing damage in the liver and glycine can suppress those Kupfer cells from secreting these inflammatory cytokines. So, you know, and it's hard, it's really hard to know um, how much we should be taking. You know, I, I was taking probably 20 to 40 grams of collagen a day. And for some reason for me, I almost, I mean, I felt my joints felt a little better, but I started like my jaw would crack a lot. And I, I think I was almost consuming too much. Like my collagen turnover might have been too much because I was wow. over consuming because now we have this really cool powder that we can take and we can jack up our levels. And it's there's <laughs> right. this really interesting balance between over supplementation and under. And this can happen with magnesium too. If you're not working out and you're over consuming magnesium, and this is what I think can happen with collagen as well. If you're not working out and turning over collagen and you're just consuming loads of it, you're spiking serum level so high, let's take magnesium, for example, it tricks the body into thinking you're overloaded from magnesium. And so you can over supplement someone with magnesium and spike their blood level so high, it tricks the body into thinking they're basically too high in magnesium and they will start becoming magnesium depleted. And only wow. in athletes and people who have the muscle to soak up the magnesium and utilize it seem to benefit. So you got to be careful with over supplementing with anything. That makes sense. And I mean, I've, I've had this little quiet obsession with glycine for several months now. And I don't think a lot of people are talking about it because, you know, I think the big thing is that we, we can survive and procreate without, while being, you know, deficient in a lot of things, you know, and glycine, I think is one of them. And I've, I've read of the, the blood sugar benefits, the, just a bunch of different, I mean, granted, each little benefit that I've read about, it's not like there's a ton of science behind it, but I'm like, okay, there's another one. There's another one. So um, we've been, like I said, we've been including the glycine supplementation, but I wanted to ask you about collagen because um, that resistant starch, uh, I, I haven't read much on this, but I've tried to see if like, if there's any way that someone, if they were to add collagen into their diet, would it act at all like a... Um, uh, what do you call the type of fiber that produces the um the resistant starch? Like a resistant starch, yeah, like a like a soluble yeah. fiber. Can it, it does, act like a, okay? So so um yeah. for someone who can't tolerate plants, would that be possibly a, a viable alternative? I mean, maybe not as good. Not at, yeah, it's not going to give you the benefits of other benefits of plants, right? Like the phytic acid, the ferulic acid that can come from plants, um, and th other things. But you are correct. And that glycine seems to be able to stimulate GLP-1 from the alpha cells in your intestine. Um, and we actually published that paper. And so oh, awesome. uh, my, myself and Dr. Mark McCarty. Um, so basically, and that's kind of how glycine works in regards to benefiting A1C and, and diabetics. There are, you, you are correct. There are actually fairly good amount of studies in diabetics that giving anywhere from 10 to 20 grams of glycine per day you know, significantly reduces A1C, improves auditor, auditory um, neur neuropathy, and improves literally diabetic hearing and hearing loss. 
um, in the, in that particular population and reduces blood pressure significantly more than what any type of low salt type of claim would, would, would do. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, you know, exactly. It's like, if you, if you don't tolerate plants, that might be a decent way to get some of the benefit. Well, that's good to know. Interesting and yeah, good to know. Maura, Maura has but I can for and, and food sensitivities. And yeah, but now that I know my food sensitivities, I've been able to cabbage is okay include with you. right some plants berries. that oh, I no, enjoy. Wait, you don't do well with berries, right? Yeah, I like berries. Okay. I do. I do like my berries and cabbage and stuff. And she I loves just, her dates around around yeah, I love her cycle. My dates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. So on the same topic of oils and fats. We have heard that you recommend krill oil as a preferred way to get extra omega-3 fatty acids in our diet. Um, can you tell our listeners why, why that would be a better, like, than let's say a regular high quality fish oil, like Nordic Naturals, for instance? Cause that's the one I take. And I'm super interested in this because I have a DNA snip that I require more. Yeah. Omega-3s. And we also give our kids like massive amounts of DNA. Yes. Yes. And it's better <laughs> for my kids for sure. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so I think both are important. Your your the fish oil is important because it's highly concentrated in the EPA and DHA, whereas krill isn't super concentrated. Okay. What you're using krill oil for is several fold. One, the phosphatidylcholine. Um, choline is very important for numerous functions in the body, and this is a highly bioavailable choline that you're getting from krill oil, um, and and you're getting. A fairly good amount, um, you know, up to 75 milligrams of choline per gram of krill oil. And you're, you know, you know, healthy adults are supposed to get, you know, two, 300 milligrams per day. So it's a great way to, to get a highly bioavailable form of choline. The second reason why krill oil is good is because it's a more bioavailable source of DHA for the brain. And so lysophosphatidylcholine DHA is what really is the, the preferred bioavailable DHA. So DHA really need to be bound, bound to lysophosphatidylcholine to, to preferentially get in. Now, we have cells called astrocytes that can actually convert um, ALA to EPA and deliver DHA to neurons. And so, you know, a lot of times you'll see animal studies give plant omega-3 and all of a sudden there's a dramatic increase in DHA in the brain and, that, and that's because there's certain cells that can do that. But to really move the needle, you need DHA bound to lysophosphatidylcholine. And so krill, krill helps you get there a little bit. And the third benefit is the astaxanthin, which is really one of the biggest keys here because the astaxanthin not only prevents the omega-3s from oxidizing in the processing in the body, but astaxanthin is, is more than just an antioxidant. It's, well, for one, it's probably one of the best antioxidants compared to any others because it can span the entire membrane. So it can protect both the outside uh, of the lipid bilayer as well as the inside. And it can also protect the in, basically any damage coming from the inside of the cell, but also the inside of the lipid bilayer, um, which is in- incredibly important. And it doesn't turn into a pro-oxidant. So most antioxidants like vitamin C, vitamin E, when it oxidizes or when it accepts an electron, it becomes a pro-oxidant. That doesn't happen with astaxanthin, um, which is why it's so beneficial. But astaxanthin can also activate AMPK, which is, oh, you know, yeah. that, that's very important for many benefits. I mean, AMPK is kind of what metformin activates to reduce glucose output in the liver and to improve kidney function. Um, and to promote longevity. So its ability to activate AMPK, I mean, we haven't published it yet, but we, we have submitted that paper that astaxanthin has that ability. Um, and so that's why krill oil, it has those three advantages really that you can't find with fish oil. So that's why I like using both. Interesting. Well, you know, I we got to add that to, we give our kids alpha GPC too. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> We were little those science experiments. No, we don't. We give them things that are obviously safe. So that's definitely something that will um, add to that. Um, wh- is there a brand that you recommend in particular? I don't want to necessarily recommend a brand. I think what's important is that it's getting sourced from Antarctic krill. If you can yeah. have a, a company that provides you, you know, the latitude of where it, the krill was harvested, um, and then 
even going above and beyond that, if the company adds organic astaxanthin to the krill oil, that's even better. Um, so I, I don't really like listing brands. That makes, that no, that makes sense. That. Just, yeah, how to find the right, yeah, yeah, what to look for in a brand is yep. more beneficial. So moving on to the next question, um, we already spoke about like the fact that you want, you know, some plant protein with the, with the um, animal protein. When I first saw the, you know, this uh, pyramid, uh, what is, I think it's called the longevity period pyramid yes. that's in the book. Yes. Um, I was assuming, you know, uh, the actual protein, like the amino acids. So you're just talking about plant sources. Is there like a specific... Or, or is there a specific type of plant protein that you that you are saying that maybe would be the beneficial one? Like, for instance, like if I wanted to, um, I don't know, pea protein or or I, I obviously we try to stick to real foods as much as possible. But the, what are the sources of like a, a good quality plant protein? Yeah, no. So so the actual pyramid in the actual book says plant foods, animal foods. Um, OK, so OK. My publisher hasn't updated the image. Huh. And I wanted to, get, gotcha. I kind of wanted to get that one out there to kind of because it's it's an important one and it's an eye grabber. Um, but yeah, it wasn't referring to actual like protein powders. It's literally referring to get your protein from both plants and animals. Now here's the here's the biggest controversy, right? Is the alkaline theory huge controversy of? Oh you know, yeah, it's a oh, big thing of why a lot yeah. of people believe plant foods are beneficial. Here's here's kind of my take on it. Um, it, it takes a very, very long time to show any type of benefit in a healthy population. I mean, it, it can take decades. So what you have to do is you have to study people where you could possibly see a benefit fairly quickly. So that's what they, that's what they did with either more fruits and vegetables or sodium and or potassium bicarbonate. So there are several randomized control trials, either giving sodium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate, or telling people to eat more fruits and vegetables to increase their alkalinity. So this is in studies of either postmenopausal women, so elderly women, or people with moderate to severe kidney disease. And those studies do show benefits in regards to kidney function and bone health. And so there does seem to be in a population that has an issue with excreting acid loads. So animal proteins are more acidic. Um, and you can't just breathe it out there. <laughs> there are, they're, they're not just volatile. You can't just breathe any of them out. It has to be t taken care of by something. What ends up happening is you, you, your body will pull things like calcium, um, from the body to basically alter your pH. So there are studies supporting this. A lot of people don't believe in the, al in the alkaline theory because, a lot of people use junk science to support it, um, but there are several randomized studies suggesting that in that, at least that patient population, you can see a benefit very quickly. You're not going to see a benefit in a healthy population. It would probably take decades. So that's why I, I do, do believe in it. And part of the reason is, is, well, a lot of people say, well, the body maintains pH uh, very closely. Well, the body also maintains magnesium levels very closely. You could be near death from magnesium deficiency and your body's going to keep your blood magnesium levels very close to normal. And so same thing's happening with mm -hmm. pH. There's something wow. at a cost to maintaining your normal pH when you're eating a diet that is very high in acidic proteins. And that cost is a reduction in citrate in the urine and a lower pH, urinary pH. And that can precipitate things like kidney stones and um, have other types of damage to, to bone health. So I do believe in the alkaline theory because there are clinical studies in humans supporting it. Um, but again, if you can't tolerate plants, then what do you do? Well, there, there is mineral waters that have natural bicarbonate. And I do drink um, a mineral water that gives me good amounts of bicarbonate. And so you don't have to eat plants per se to bring on the alkalinity, but I do think it's important. You know, I, I, you don't have to twist my arm because it's funny because I, I have become known as one of these, uh, one of the, the voices or the faces of carnivore and, and I love carnivore. You know, I, I did, I think for everyone, you know, you do a period, um, all of a sudden, a lot of these deficiencies, they get back to normal. Um, but it, 
I, listen, I love I love some plants. You know, there's some plants that I love. So, um, you know, I think people should be doing their research or trying to learn more. And I understand people just want a simple answer. But on this podcast, we're trying to get them to think more. Um, right. So we trust yeah. me, we appreciate it. And, and the thing is, too, is, you know, I don't blame people for loving carnivore. You're going to feel great on carnivore, right? <laughs> like it's yeah. not plants are kind of somewhat inflammatory. That's part of their benefit. I mean, exercise is beneficial because not because it's anti-inflammatory, you damage yourself in a way. It's a, it's a little bit of hormesis. Yeah. And so plants actually provide uh, sort of like uh, an internal low dose damage to upregulate your own antioxidant response elements. That's the ultimate goal. Most antioxidants don't work via their scavenging of antioxidants. A lot of people have that issue wrong. Even astaxanthin promotes moderate levels of actual oxidative stress. And through that, if you look at any study, it'll tell, it'll show you that astaxanthin increases the antioxidant response element by increasing NRF2. So antioxidants are actually working mainly through their ability to give you a little bit of inflammation and ov- stimulate your overall anti-inflammatory responses in your own body. And so that's why people do that's why plants sometimes suck when you eat them because they are somewhat <laughs> inflammatory. And it's like, do you want to, some people don't want to have a lifelong low suffering of their joints, to get lo- somewhat of a long-term benefit from that. Right. So I don't blame a lot of people for going on carnivore for that reason. Uh, you know, and it's, it reminds me and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I've always been, I've never looked into it cause I never cared enough, but like, when you take like a, a lemon uh, you, and you squeeze it into water and you drink it, it does have like an alkalizing effect, which was, I mean, uh, the way I understand it. And yes. and it's an acid, which yes. is weird. So it's kind of like you're, the same thing, right? You're right. Yeah. So acidic things like um, citric acid actually forms a base in your body um, and boosts your bicarbonate levels. So it is a little counterintuitive how eating acidic foods, like you just said, like squeezing lemon juice actually makes your body more basic. (laughs) That's so interesting. Well, that's another way, I guess, to get that bicarbonate, I guess, to alkalinize. Cool. Super cool stuff. So, all right, well, let's move a little um, on to intermittent fasting. We get asked so much. I probably get asked daily about this. Um, We love it and we encourage people to do it, especially when it comes naturally. And we can definitely go into why it's, you know, a crucial part of this whole pyramid. But first, I'd like to get your thoughts on something that we're asked about a lot. So I get I get asked a lot if coffee and fat. So like a keto coffee, if that breaks a fast. And I usually tell them that if they're doing it to keep insulin levels down um, and to try to remain in a more fat burning environment, then the literature seems to indicate that. The coffee and some fat is not breaking the fast, but when it comes to longevity or maybe to treat medical conditions, I'm assuming it would. And, you know, people like uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick says it does. Uh, What are your thoughts about the whole breaking the fast uh, with the fat? Hmm. I've never really thought about it like that, to be honest. I think um, people get a little obsessed with, you know, the term (laughs) breaking your fast, though, doing that, right? Like they get more like with the caught up with the tagline than totally. Let's like focus on the bigger picture. Um, But I I don't know. I don't think there's a a huge issue. I do think that um, when it comes to just overall uh, cream in your coffee, I was adding too much. So fat bombs will will totally ruin a a good optimized uh, ketogenic diet. If you're putting uh, loads of cream in your coffee, I'm telling you right now, your weight loss is going to stall. And it happened happened to me. And, you know, because you go through a transition, right? You go through like when you're first learning about this stuff, okay, it makes sense. Lower the refined carbs. Now, all of a sudden, everything fat is great, right? (laughs) (laughs) And then you overdo it. You start like just adding cream and butter to coffee just for the fun of it. And then, and then uh, all of a sudden your weight loss stalls and you realize, wait a second, just eating loads of fat isn't actually the way to slim down. And then dairy fat. Right. Exactly. And then people start kind of trying to increase more of their protein. And and so then they actually, you know, benefit themselves more in regards to satiety and muscle gain and lowering their fat loss. And then they start kind of reading about, well, geez, high protein might be low longevity. And so like there, there's this circle of knowledge, I feel <laughs> at least that I've 
you know, I feel came the same across, way, yeah. right? <laughs> like you, you slowly, you know, add like a notch of knowledge to your belt. And I feel like I'm, I've come full circle in a way. Um, yeah. and, and so to go back to the intermittent fasting, um, I kind of view it as if you're not working out, because I want, I want people to understand like working out, like exercising is your intermittent fast. Like you don't need to intermittently fast per se. You don't need to skip breakfast if you worked out like the night before, like you're, you're already in a fasted state. Like you've, you've skipped a meal by working out essentially. Yeah. Um, so if they're, so they're the people that have more muscle too, you're burning fat better. You're, you're going to yeah. get into a quote unquote fasted state much quicker than someone else. And you may not necessarily need to skip breakfast. So people need to take their own personal physiology yes. and physique and lifestyle into effect when it comes to how often you intermittent fast. Um, but that being said, I try to intermittent fast about three days a week on days that I don't exercise. Um, I generally skip breakfast because it's the easiest one for meal for me to skip. And some people will just do a one meal a day. They'll do, quote unquote, a 24 hour fast. The thing is, though, is, you know, I think a 24 hour fast is OK, but I don't know about every day. I think it's really hard to get an optimal amount, amount of all of your nutrients in just one meal. Um, I think you know, maybe a couple times a week, it's probably okay. But to, to just only eat one meal a day, every single day for the rest of your life, I would love to see what that meal is made of to really hit optimal amounts of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, fiber. I think it's very difficult to do. Um, and then how long do you fast? I've struggled with this. I mean, I've, I've literally looked at so many fasting studies to try to understand what is the optimal amount of fasting. Um, and, and when do you really turn on autophagy? How long do you have to fast to do that? And that's going to depend on the person. And fasting for longer periods of time seems to be much more beneficial for people who are very overweight mm -hmm. versus yeah. someone who is lean. Because you're going to start, you know, really breaking down your own muscle much quicker if you are lean versus someone who is more severely overweight. So if you're under a doctor's supervision and you are being monitored for your vitamin mineral status... Um, and you are, um, you're going to probably benefit more if you're more overweight, um, by fasting longer periods. Um, so for j just in general to really, um, deplete the glycogen stores, you know, it takes about 12 hours if you're not working out, although you can deplete glycogen stores very quickly if you are intensely working out. So you can almost, like I said, intermittent fast just by working out, um, and then again, like where, where does, where does it become unsafe to fast? You become B, uh, B vitamin deficient within about six days of fasting because you don't store B vitamins. Most people will become magnesium deficient within 21 days and supplementation, even taking a full multivitamin isn't going to fully offset those deficiencies. So people need to be careful doing extended fasts. Um, but there does seem to be some type of benefit. I mean, if you look at animal studies for one to four days of fasting, there are several animal studies that do show that fasting can actually regenerate beta cells. Now, the data is wow. somewhat preliminary because there's, there's maybe only three studies showing this. Um, but what ends up happening is in these animal studies, fasting will activate a transcription factor called neurogenin-3. This is what actually gets increased when we're in the uterus to grow our own pancreatic isolate cells. Well, fasting, in, at least in animals, can stimulate that transcription factor. You're almost tapping into the, the amazing physiology that happens when you are forming in your, you know, your mother's womb. You're tapping into some of that amazing longevity transcriptional factors when you fast, at least in animal studies and human studies that look at um, pancreatic isolates also show that fasting increases neurogenin-3. And the animal studies do show that it absolutely does, um, you know, stimulate beta cell regeneration and can reverse type 1 and two, type 2 diabetes in animal studies. Um, whether that can happen in humans, I mean, I think there are some case reports that fasting in humans definitely can potentially um, quote unquote, I don't want to say reverse type two diabetes, but all of a sudden their A1C is back to normal. I don't know if you can call that reversing or curing. That's another whole debate, right? That right? there's always yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, because if you say that, <clears throat> I mean, how do you really tell if someone's completely cured? Right. I mean, cause just like just an A1C level doesn't really necessarily tell you that, but 
a lot of the biomarkers indicating poor glycemic control, right, are improved when when people go on certain amounts of fasting periods and protocols. Um, so there may be some type of benefit to. I don't want necessarily want to say beta cell regeneration, but I mean even improving the beta cell health um, because what ends up happening is this is kind of what the longevity solution goes into is this balance between you know nutrient deprivation which stimulates maintenance and repair and AMPK versus a surplus of protein, which tells the body that there is a lot of nutrients grow, um, you know, mTOR is activated. You don't need to focus on maintenance and repair and longevity. And there is some truth to this. I mean, from, from the single cell across all animals, mTOR and AMPK, you know, cross all cell lines. So it is like an ancient nutrient sensing system. And there absolutely is this increase in AMPK when either you work out or you fast, which does increase maintenance and repair versus if you're eating a high protein diet, um, constantly without doing intermittent fasting and protein cycling, where you're constantly stimulating mTOR. So there's this balance. You do want to stimulate mTOR at certain periods of time. And then you also don't want to, and you want to activate AMPK. And so really the book is about protein cycling and being smart about it using intermittent fasting. I, I love that you said that because I've been really interested in mTOR lately. Obviously everybody is because it's one of those things that if for the person who's not looking at this stuff, they're just terrified of mTOR. And here I am thinking of, you know, as a person who doesn't consume carbohydrate, I probably rely on mTOR a lot more for protein synthesis because of its, you know, how it acts similar to insulin, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so, uh, you know, this this whole thing where it's 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 bad to stimulate mTOR because of, of the fact that mTOR is high in cancer patients and things like that. Um, but you're like you're saying, this is you're cycling it. You're you're, and it makes sense because we're seasonal people in life in general. I think variety. I'm learning more and more that variety is good, and maybe our desire for variety is there for a reason. Yeah. And so many people I'm telling you, they, they just feel better eating a higher protein diet. So if you can, there are downsides to it, but there are ways that you can offset the downsides and reap the benefits of a high protein diet. And that's what the longevity solution is all about. It's giving people those little tips that they need so that they can consume that high protein diet and get the benefits of muscle growth, satiety, increase in lean mass, decrease in fat mass, but, but not always having mTOR completely ramped up and not always consuming the acid load and the things we talked about. So it's those little keys that can kind of allow someone, let's say, to consume a more higher protein diet, but also make it more of a longevity diet. I I am so excited to read this book. I'm telling you this from the stuff you've shared. I'm super pumped. But I I'm I I thought it was super interesting on the back on the pyramid because you have green tea in its own section and it's closer to the base and then above the green tea is the coffee and the red wine. And the first thing I think of when I see all three is the polyphenol content. So where is green tea unique that and advantageous and that it it gets its own section versus the coffee and the wine? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, part of the reason is, is there's just so many more studies on green tea showing benefit than studies using coffee or red wine, like clinical studies. So clinical studies in humans do show that green tea really in particular when they add, um, EGCG. So this is like a catechin enhanced green tea. You have to drink a lot of green tea Like you have, like basically how they do it in Asian cultures is they drink green tea around the clock. Like it's not, it's, it's not like, um, you're not, you're never going to see one little cup a day. People drinking green tea in gallons, right? Yeah. They're drinking like 10 cups a day, um, or more. And so, you know, where, you know, in America, we just kind of wanted to say, oh, I just had one cup of green tea. I'm going to get the benefits and Mm -hmm. not, that's not really the case. So either a catechin, like an EGCG enhanced green tea is going to really provide these benefits. And, uh, but basically what the studies do show is those, those EGCG enhanced green teas do lower blood pressure, do improve glycemic control, do increase basal metabolic rate. You're burning about 70 to hundred calories more doing nothing do increase fat burning. So beta oxidation goes up, 
quite substantially, 10, 15% doing absolutely nothing. Um, and then the e, again, the EGCG is very important um, in regards to um, just overall anti-inflammatory effects. So that's why green tea gets its own category because there's just so much more evidence for it. Um, and also you can kind of drink it throughout the day, whereas coffee is best in the morning to kind of stimulate you. Well, well, green tea doesn't have nearly as much caffeine. And so, you know, if you can kind of switch over later in the day to green tea, it makes a lot more sense. Very, very interesting. Obviously, we we don't drink any alcohol. We we've lost our privileges, both of us. We've spoken about that. So um, so maybe the dates, the blueberries, that would maybe take the place of the wine. Yeah. So basically, the reason why red wine is in particular is beneficial, and it and, and it kind of stinks too because white wine tastes probably better to most people. But unfortunately, no pain, no gain. Sometimes, <laughs> right. Well, yeah. the the red wine, the reason why it's beneficial is because it is um, fermented with the grape skins and the grape seeds. And uh, kind of unfortunately, resveratrol is amazing, but it's only truly bioavailable when it comes from red wine. And so Ooh, that's good that's, to know people, people, because we we've said that before where, where that, well, you get the resveratrol. Um, why drink wine? You know, because if you drink alcohol, it's not the alcohol that's doing it. It's the resveratrol. So you're saying that because of the fermentation, it's more what bioavailable? It, it's the only really, from what I've read, the only true bioavailable form of resveratrol. So you don't have to get, you can get a red wine that has no alcohol in it and get the resveratrol, the bioavailable resveratrol. And the reason why resveratrol is beneficial is because it activates your longevity genes. It turns, it activates CERT1, which eventually will activate AMPK. And um, it's kind of interesting that sleep does the same thing. Sleep kind of works like red wine. Sleep act, melatonin activates CERT1. So you can actually stimulate autophagy, not through just, you know, drinking red wine, moderate, very, very <laughs> low amount. We have the recommend, the recommended amount in the book in regards to where it seems to be associated with the lowest risk of XYZ from studies. But, um, you know, uh, melatonin when you're sleeping also activates CERT1, which is why sleep is so important. Everyone's like, well, why is sleep important? And there's, of course, the glymphatic system and the cleaning out of the cellular debris, but also this, the melatonin release and activation of CERT1 and AMPK when you're sleeping is important. Very cool. Yeah, we, we've been also learning about the glymphatic system. That's another cool one that people may not know about because um, we spoke about sleep the other week uh, on you know, how bad sleep can hinder fat loss. Um, we are obviously so short on time. So uh, we were, I had the salt stuff. We got stuff. through a lot though. We did good. Yeah, yeah. I was like, let's forget about this salt stuff. He's probably <laughs> sick of freaking talking about salt as much as we love it. We know it's on top of the uh, pyramid. So it's obviously. I'll important. never be sick of talking about salt, but yeah. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Um, well, we appreciate your time. Can you tell, first of all, tell everybody where they can find you and, you know, on social media, on the, on the internet? Yeah. The, um, so my website is drjamesdenick.com. Um, I'm pretty active on Instagram at Dr. James Dinek, and, um, uh, people can have to follow me on my professional Facebook page, which is Dr. James Dinek Lantonio, and they can, um, they can pick up a copy of the longevity solution on Amazon for pre-order. It comes out, uh, February 26th. Man, awesome. we are excited to read that book. I'm super pumped to see what you guys came up with. Uh, I think it couldn't have come at a better time, so we're pumped. And thank you so much for your time. We learned so much on this episode. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Danny.